Welcome to Frequency Matters, the RF Microwave Update Series. I'm Pat Hindle, and I'm here with my co-host, Eric Heim. This episode, we're going to cover our December government and military electronics issue. Our cover story is Comparing SDRs for Aerospace and Defense Electronics, written by Pervisis, and they compare SDRs from their company, NI, and Herrick Labs, and kind of talk about the features and advantages of each and why an SDR solution is good in these applications. Eric, what else did we have for technical features? Thanks, Pat. Uh, well, we have what I think is an interesting look at uh, a really important topic with a special report from the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C. Uh, over the summer, China announced new licensing requirements for exports of gallium and germanium. Uh, so the article looks at the specifics of gallium production and what the future might hold if that mineral follows the same trajectory as other mineral production where China has been involved. Uh, now, the topic has receded from the public eye a bit, but the entire RF and microwave industry relies on gallium for gas and GAN devices. So uh, big implications if that supply is disrupted. Uh, and some of the information, I think, was pretty eye-opening. And getting back to uh, the more conventional coverage areas, we had an article from Times Microwave talking about the new connector family that they've developed to solve some of the challenges of harsh defense applications. And the article also goes into detail about how connector development has become a collaborative process uh, and some of the things that users should consider when working with manufacturers. Uh, so that's a good read. And so we had a special guest join us today, Dan Ford, product line engineering manager for Mini Circus high frequency product line join me to discuss the millimeter wave market and how many circuits is meeting the challenges in that area. Let's take a look at a clip from that now. You know, what do you think sets many circuits apart from other suppliers that are working in the millimeter wave space? So, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, first and foremost, I'd say our performance, right? So we spend a lot of time, we put a lot of effort into our matching structures using full EM wave, uh, EM uh, simulation software. We spend a lot of time on uh, thermal analysis of our modules. And we really, we take it to the next level with performance. And the data that you see on the website, that's not the best performing unit. We usually take the absolute typical middle of the road unit and post that on our website so you know exactly what you're going to be getting. So I, I think it's really important to, uh, to note that. Um, you know, another great benefit of mini circuits is that we're able to use our own mimics and our own catalog. And that's huge, right? So not only do we have control over performance in the uh, bare die or SMT modules that we're using, but we also have control over quality. But most of all, uh, and this is a biggie, is supply chain. So it's policy for mini circuits to always support all these components. We're not going to end of life any of these components. So that's great for us because in our connectorized modules, we're always going to have that. We're always going to have them in stock so that we could always put them into our modules. So it was really interesting to talk with Dan about the millimeter wave market and impressive that mini circuits now goes to 110 gigahertz with their devices. And uh, turning to the news and keeping on the aerospace and defense front, Keysight Technologies received an $18.5 million U.S. Air Force contract, and they'll integrate and deliver two electronic warfare threat simulator systems with sustainment support consisting of software patch management, field engineering support, spare parts, and storage. Northrop Grumman and Rodin Schwartz signed a Memorandum of Understanding at the Berlin Security Conference in Germany, and they'll collaborate on turnkey solutions for fifth to fourth generation interoperability. The MOU addresses current and future challenges to connect Europe and U.S. assets in the dimensions of air, ground, and sea. Galat Satellite Networks announced that the U.S. Army awarded nearly $20 million contract to their U.S.-based subsidiary WaveStream and that's for a continuation of sustainment at any time, anywhere satellite connectivity that includes their solid state power amplifiers. And lastly, Raytheon was awarded a four-year, $15 million contract from DARPA 
to increase the electronic capability of RF sensors with high power density GAN transistors. The improved transistors are targeting 16 times higher output power than the traditional GAN devices with no increase in operating temperature. And I just completed a podcast with them on this topic, so that will release next Tuesday, so check that out. Eric, what did you see in the news? Well, this is a favorite time of the year for me, and uh, not just because of the holidays, but because the Ericsson Mobility Update is released. Uh, Now, this report looks at subscribers and traffic and not infrastructure, uh, and they acknowledge economic and geopolitical unrest, uh, but they estimate 5G subscribers increased by 63% from 2022, and both subscribers and data traffic will grow by at least three times by 2029. So that's promising, uh, but no comments on infrastructure. But speaking of infrastructure, Ericsson and AT&T are collaborating in an industry defining roughly $14 billion five-year network transformation and digitalization strategic agreement to pioneer the path to programmable and intelligent networks of the future. The deal is the largest financially in Ericsson's history and displaces Nokia. Ericsson will deploy a wide range of Ericsson 5G open radio access networks, products, and solutions to support AT&T's nationwide open RAN ambitions in the U.S. The company will build 5G network platform for AT&T, utilizing cloud-native technologies built on ORAN, standardized interfaces with industry scale, cost efficiency, sustainability, and high performance top of mind. Uh, through time, AT&T and Ericsson will transform this to a cloud-native open network. Uh, so kind of interesting. And so turning to events, EDICon Online will transform into a quarterly event next year. We didn't want to start right at the beginning of the year, so we're doing the newly formed EDICon Online Educational Days in April, May, August, and October as we transition to a quarterly schedule over 2024. You can check that out at edicononline.com and find out more details there. And a big heads up for our next episode, which will be the last one of the year, be releasing on December 21st. This is going to be a great episode. I'm so excited about it. We're going to be doing an AI holiday, Frequency Matters, and Eric and I will be using AI to extensively create images, audio, and animation to put together the episode. So look for that coming up next. And even Jin Baines, who's the new CEO of Mini Circuits, will be joining us for a quick interview and participation in the gift giving. Yeah, that, that'll be a good one. Keep an eye out for that one. Uh, but that wraps up this episode. Our sponsors are RFMW and Mini Circuits. RFMW is a technical distributor of RF and microwave products and now power management. When you start your next design, consider their multiple product lines. Mini Circuits is a global leader in the design, manufacture, and distribution of RF and microwave components and integrated assemblies with more than 10,000 active models. And remember, as a member of the industry, a subscription to Microwave Journal is free, so please visit our site and subscribe today if you're not already a reader. Uh, Thanks for watching this episode, and please join us next time for another Frequency Matters.